This is a lecture video on the lymphatic and immune system. So the lymphatic system can be subdivided into lymphatics, which is the, the study of um, the, the, the fluid, this, this plasma-like fluid called lymph, um, and the route that it takes, and what goes on inside of it, that sort of thing, so the lymphatic side of it. And then the immunity, can, the, the, the second piece is immunity, which is taking a, a, a closer look at the cells involved like the natural killer cells and the the lymphocytes the T cells the B cells neutrophils stuff like that um, and antibodies and so on so when we say lymphatic system it could refer to just the the fluid and the vessels or it could refer, refer to um, immunity as well so we'll, 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 we'll divide it into lymphatics first. We'll talk about that first. And then this, the second half of this video, we'll talk about the immunity aspect of it. So just a, a general overview then um, of the lymphatic system. It, it can, consists of vessels, lymphatic vessels, which structurally look like uh, the vessels of the circulatory system, pretty much. <laughs> And then it, uh, it also consists of uh, a fluid called lymph, which looks something like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like plasma, uh, plasma proteins, uh, white blood cells. <laughs> and, um, and then there's a number of lymphatic structures and organs con containing lymphatic tissue where lymph doesn't necessarily flow through, but it does have a part in immunity because it, it might, uh, these tissues might have uh, B, B cells and T cells, for example, or macrophages in them doing stuff. So we put them with the lymphatic system. And finally, bone marrow where stem cells develop into various types of other blood cells. <clears throat> so so I guess the you know the first question is well wh wh where does this all start where where we need somewhere to start well <clears throat> it's it's the lymphatic system is closely linked to the circulatory system so as we know we have veins and arteries and um, veins take blood to the heart and arteries take blood away from the heart. And the oxygen-rich arteries, most of them you know, are oxygen-rich then. They reach the cells. The arteries go, you know, they, they you start with an artery, then they split into several arterioles, and then from arterioles to capillaries. The circulatory system capillaries. And it's at the capillaries where you have gas exchange. Well, when blood finally reaches these systemic capillaries to bring nutrients to the cells, the liquid portion of the blood, the plasma, like water, plasma proteins, and so on, percolates through the walls and into this interstitial fluid to be, be, be available for cells. So in between the cells, we have this interstitial fluid where um, the, 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 where the blood um percolates percolates uh, uh, not red blood cells but the the plasma part well it's it is then picked up by the lymphatic capillaries which are right there right right there they're nearby lymphatic capillaries are a one-way street unlike the circulatory system where it's it's cyclic you have blood going to the cells and then away from the cells to the heart away from the heart well um the lymphatic capillaries is a is a one-way street it's only taking fluid to back to the heart one-way street and so this fluid that whatever fluid that enters the lymphatic capillaries the lymphatic vessels is now called lymph <clears throat> 
Lymph travels through the lymphatic vessels and then, lymph and then through the lymphatic nodes to be cleaned and back to the circulatory system. And that's, that's the, the overview of, of, of the route. <clears throat> So here is a, uh, a diagram you can see lymph is always, lymphatic vessels is always depicted in green. So you have red for, ox for oxygen poor blood, you have, uh, sorry, oxygen rich blood, you have blue for oxygen poor, you have yellow for the hepatic portal system, <clears throat> and, but you have green for the lymphatic system. Okay. So here's also a general uh, general list of, of functions. We're going to go more and more and more in depth into all this. But in general, the lymphatic system returns plasma, like we just spoke about, plasma and plasma proteins, which have escaped from the capillaries, back into the bloodstream. But it also filters body fluids, uh, like blood and lymph, of... So within then, then like in the in your lymphatic nodes, for example, it will filter um, the blood, this plasma and stuff of bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, cancer cells, dead cells, and then destroys them through the through white blood cells in these lymphatic nodes and tonsils, and and and, and spleen. And, and and even more. I, I mean, and, and even in your connective tissue and, and stuff like that. Uh, the immunity aspect: the, the 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 lymph nodes, red bone marrow, tonsils, thymus gland, and spleen produce white blood cells, which protect us from disease. We're gonna we're gonna see here in a minute which ones. As we know, there's five general white uh, type types of white blood cells, and then the, those can be further subdivided into more and more and more. And uh, and then finally, um, the lymphatic system absorbs the end products of uh, a fat digestion um, and, the, and the fat soluble vitamins from the small intestine and then transports them back into the bloodstream um, through what we call microchylons and um, and 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 so and the appearance of lymph looks it look it basically looks like milk it looks like a like this watery milk substance and the reason why is because of this number four uh, because it picks up um, fats from the digestive system beginning with the lacteals and then transports them to the blood through these these chylomicrons uh, back back into the blood so lymph Lymph, although uh, most of the lymph, I mean, is basically blood. I mean, h half of it is is blood. I mean, it's you have blood <clears throat> that diffuses into the uh, uh, interstitial fluid, the plasma, and and white blood cells and stuff, uh, and then it's picked right back up into the um, lymphatic capillaries. But it's it doesn't have the red blood cells, and so instead of it being red, it looks white because it also picks up the fat from the from the from the intestines. Again, green. You see you see here. Uh, so you see all the little um, the little balls. So those are the lymphatic nodes. Those are the lymph nodes, and they are in line with the lymphatic vessels. And you see you got the the, the spleen there. Um, and again, all this is all one way, from the tip of your finger all the way up to your, one of your two subclavian veins up there. Uh, everything down in the, from, the, to from the toe all the way up to uh, one of the two, um, uh, up to your subclavian veins. One way street, one direction. All these are, and of course everything from the head is going down since the head is above the, uh, is superior to your subclavian veins. <clears throat> so as we go through here, uh, as, as we go through, there's many, many questions. Here's just a few. So uh, a few questions that you can kind of think about as we're talking 
going through the, the, the these slides, what, what is lymph made out of? What's the pathway that it takes from beginning to end? Uh, by what mechanism is lymph formed? What are you know what are the steps? One, two, three. Where does lymph end up? So we have already answered a few of these already. And um, the last one on this slide, does all does all collected lymph eventually end up in one lymphatic vessel? Or is it more than one? All right, so here is the pathway of the escaped plasma back into back into one of the two subclavian veins. Step one, two, three, four. So here's one first we start with the capillaries, lymphatic capillaries. So um, the lymphatic vessels begin as close-ended lymphatic capillaries located between the cells in the capillary in the in the capillary beds. Just as blood capillaries converge to form venules and veins, lymphatic capillaries, they look very similar, but have a slightly larger diameter, slightly thinner walls, and even more valves than veins. So it, they, look, they look very close to, anatomically, uh, to, to veins, except that the, the, the walls are a little thinner. There's more valves. Remember, you don't have any valves in arteries, but you do have valves in veins. Well, so do the lymphatic vessels as well. They also have valves. Why? And and why even more? Well, there's no pump. Remember, there, there's no pump. There's no heart here in the lymphatic system. They, 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 we need help to move the lymph back to your subclavian veins. We need help. The valves, and, and we don't get much, um, no, I mean, we get sufficient, but valves is one way. The, which, I mean, they, they don't actively do anything. They're, they're passive. They, they just prevent the, the backflow going the wrong direction. They don't move, make things go forward, but at least they, they help not letting things, not letting the, the lymph go back, you know, back to your toe. The, the simple squamous epithelial cells, which make up the capillary walls, overlap each other like, like, like flap-like valves making them very permeable. When pressure is greater in the interstitial fluid than in the lymph, the cells separate just enough, like a swinging door, and fluid is forced in because there's higher pressure in your interstitial fluid. Once the pressure inside the capillary exceeds that of the interstitial fluid, then, as you might imagine, the cells once again, close, they adhere more closely, and then not, nothing escapes, just like a valve. The pressure is relieved as lymph moves up through the vessel. Let's just take a look here. So you see, here's a, here's a capillary, and you see the, uh, the simple squamous there lining the, making up the capillary, and you see it's closed, it's, it's one way, close ended, it's one direction, one way street. So there's always a, a starting point and an ending point with the circulatory system. There is there is no beginning and end. It's it's cyclic, but with lymph, um, it there's there's a, a start and an end. And so you see you see these arrows going into the lymphatic capillary, and so and through and and the arrow goes right through, right between two uh, simple squamous cells. And so you kind of see that they, they kind of look like doors. They sort of swing open just enough. It's not like a door in a house, 100% opening up 180 degrees, but just enough for lymph to, to get through, for, or for fluid to get fluid that, that becomes lymph, when the pressure in the interstitial fluid is greater than that in the lymphatic capillary. All right, so... Let's continue here with, with step one. So the collected escaped plasma, plasma proteins, and of course anything else that you might find in the blood that's escaped out of out of the blood into this into the interstitial fluid, like microbes and dead cells and, and what else you might have in the blood, um, inside the lymph the lymph capillaries is now called lymph. So now we call it lymph. We don't say like plasma or anything like that. Now it's called lymph. 
Also in the small intestine, the specialized lymphatic capillaries called lacteals carry these lipids into the lymphatic vessels and, of course, ultimately to, to the blood. And, uh, and the, this fluid is, is called chyle. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in general, the lymphatic capillaries con converge with other lymphatic capillaries to form, here now we see, uh, they form vessels. What kind of vessels? Afferent. Afferent means towards. Towards what? Towards is always referring to something. Towards, not, tor not necessarily towards, well, it is towards the heart, but um, here we're taught, when we say afferent in the lymphatic system, we are referring to towards the lymph node, towards the lymph nodes, afferent. So, step one, lymphatic capillaries, and now step two, afferent lymphatic uh, vessels. Afferent lymphatic vessels bring dirty lymph towards the lymph node. Why dirty? Well, it's, remember there's you have microbes, you got viruses, you got anything, you got you have any kind of pathogen, dead, 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 uh, or, or worn out blood cells, stuff like that. Um, and they're picked up, they're picked up by the capillary, then they go into a blood, uh, the lymphatic vessels. Well, these, the first ones are called afferent. Why are they considered dirty? Because, well, the where they're going, they're going towards the lymph node and the lymph node will clean will there you will you will destroy um uh viruses or bacteria or things will get activated the your lymphocytes will be will become activated and leave the lymph node um but and and so we call that so we 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 call that lymph dirty lymph because when it leaves it's cleaner than it's not a, maybe not a hundred percent clean, but it's it's cleaner than uh, than the lymph than when it than what it looked like when it was going into the lymph node. And again, their structure is like veins, where you have these 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 three different tunicas: tunica externa, interna, media, and uh, and you got valves. <laughs> Here there, um, here's a de depiction, and you see the valves in there. Though that that little V there, those aren't that's not connected. Um, that's those valves again, just just like with uh, with your um, veins are made out of this this tunica intima, the the inner lining. And uh, when lymph goes through those those two little lines that make up the V, they open up. And let the lymph through, and then when pressure exceeds that of below, it it uh, cl the valve closes. And then up up at top up on top there, you see how the lymphatic vessel is is con is, is considerably thinner. It is considerably thinner than the wall is than than the vein and especially the artery. Okay. Now the afferent sends the dirty lymph to the nodes. Here's a here's a, a, a picture of um, a node, lymph node. Lymph nodes are are located along lymphatic vessels and are in line. As you see, they're in line. They're not like off to the side. And uh, and then step four, they send cleaned lymph into the uh, efferent. So you have afferent. You have afferent, so here, um, where would the afferent vessels be? Where would you see them? There's four. You see there's four there, sending dirty lymph, bringing dirty lymph to the lymph node. Then, then step three would be um, the lymph node. And then step four, the lymph will be sent into the efferent, meaning going away from the lymph node. And that's just the one. Now you notice, I, I, I want you, it's, it's important to, to have this, uh, to, to orient yourself correctly with this, this lymph node. You see how there's like this hillis, this indentation, sort of like the heart, just like the heart, 
you have the apex at the bottom and the base up at the top where you have like that indentation between the two atria. Well, here it's kind of the shape, like a kidney bean, you know, it's, it's shaped the same, the same way. And that's important. This you would find like in the leg or in the arm uh, because I want you to know which vessels take lymph towards the node and which ones take away. And so if this thing were, you know, so all, all the lymph here is moving up the screen. If this, if this lymph node was turned, turned around, then you would, you should know that all the lymph would be going down. But we generally depict it like this because most lymph moves, you know, superior. It moves against gravity because our subclavian veins, because our heart is almost at the top of our body. So that makes sense. Everything in our, our trunk, our chest, our legs, our abdomen, our arms, everything is moving up, up against gravity. <clears throat> so you got uh, the lymph nodes, then the lymph nodes will then send cleaned lymph uh, uh, to the efferent lymphatic vessels, and there they carry um, that lymph uh, away from the lymph node. And just like the efferent lymphatic vessels, they 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 have they have veins and and valves and everything like that. And then step five, these guys will merge to form a. Uh, trunks, lymphatic trunks. You got lumbar trunks, intestinal trunks, and, and so on. I don't care that you memorize all the different uh, names of these lymphatic trunks. However, I do think it's important for you to know that the efferent merged, they converge to form lymph, lymph trunks. Okay, so just know that these, what comes after the efferent vessels, the trunks, the lymph, the lymph, the lymphatic trunks. And, and, uh, and then these trunks, step five now, step five lymphatic trunks, these then will converge even more to become one of two ducts. So you have, um, you, you, so, so, so from the top, we had lymphatic capillaries, and those merge, converged into afferent lymphatic vessels to the lymph node, to the efferent lymphatic vessels, to the lymph trunks, and then from the lymph, lymph trunks, they will converge into either the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. I want you to know which duct drains into which subclavian vein. And also I want you to know which of these ducts collects lymph from, from which parts of the body. So the thoracic duct collects lymph from the, from the left head, the left chest, left arm, and all, and the, and the abdomen, and all the legs. That's the thoracic duct, and it dumps, and it drains its it, the the lymph into left left. So everything everything here is obviously on the, obviously on the on the left. It dumps it into the uh, left subclavian vein. And you see it there, kind of on on the top there, left sub left sub clavian vein eventually merges to form the uh, uh, the brachycephalic vein and then to the superior vena cava. Okay, and it's right here. Thoracic duct, left, 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 everything below the ribs and empty, empties into the left subclavian vein. The right lymphatic duct collects lymph from the right head, the right chest, and the right arm. It's just the way it is. It, 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 you know, it might 
be easier if 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 they if they were named the 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 right lymphatic duct and the left lymphatic duct but it it isn't this is just the way it is right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct so the right lymphatic duct collects from not fr from significantly less of the body right head right chest right arm but then it dumps it into the right subclavian vein as you see there and here you see it kind of you see the boxes and everything in the boxes they all converge and form the right lymphatic duct and dump into the right subclavian vein and then right then on the subclavian vein with the uh, with the jugular um, converges into the brachiocephalic and then to the uh, superior vena cava okay so I, I do want you to know um, you know step five the, the the names of the two collecting ducts where they collect the blood from uh, sorry lymph from and then where do they dump the lymph to is it the left subclavian or the right subclavian okay well um, the th roughly three um, liters a day drains into the lymphatic vessels to become lymph because most plasma proteins are too large to leave the blood capillaries interstitial fluid contains only a small amount of, of protein proteins that do that do enter the interstitial fluid cannot return to the blood by diffusion because of the high concentration gradient inside the blood capillaries and proteins can however um, move readily through the more permeable lymphatic capillaries, which is why we always say plasma proteins. That so there are there is some plasma proteins that do enter the lymphatic capillaries. Here you see um, an even more zoomed in diagram and lymph uh, moving from the interstitial fluid. See the cells and there's a little bit of space, and um, and the fluid can move through those valve-like walls of the lymphatic capillaries. Um, there's a couple more ways that uh, that help the lymph move back to the heart. By Number one, by the milking action of the skeletal muscle contraction, just as we just as we know with the uh, with the veins, same deal except now we're talking about lymph lymphatic vessels is same thing when you contract for example uh, your your gastrocnemius uh, you create um, uh, the 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 volume in there the space decreases therefore you're forcing lymph to go either up or down but but, but because you have valves that close when the pressure increases the lymph is forced up towards your subclavian veins just just like uh, just like we saw in the in the circulatory system with the veins, so walking, walking or f just flexing or jumping, whatever jumping jacks, um, anything, any kind of exercise like that, um, will uh, also aids the return of of lymph. And we generally talk like like when we talk about the return of lymph always you're always going to see you're, we're, you'll always talk you know you always hear people talking about the legs because uh well they're the furthest away and um you know you usually don't swing your legs up up over your head <laughs> like you could with your arms so you know we always we always go straight to the gastrocnemius or the soleus um but there is also another way and that's by breathing in when you breathe in there's uh, pressure changes and pressure uh, in your abdomen is greater than the pressure in the uh, in, in, in the thoracic cavity and therefore lymph is forced up and then you breathe out and you breathe in and so breathing so make sure to exercise and make sure to breathe so and and then of course you know so one two then of course we talked about uh, you know like the pressure in the interstitial fluid increasing and decreasing but you you don't really have much control over that okay very good doing good 
I do want you to know uh, a couple of percentages. So as the circulatory system is sending blood down and up and down and up, well, 90% of the escaped plasma and plasma proteins returns back to the circulatory system, 90%. 90% of the blood that escapes just goes right back, you see, uh, along with everything else. So this is, we, we've already covered this, we, we know this. However, the lymph, the lymphatic system picks up the other 10%. 10% of the escaped plasma, plasma proteins remains in, in the intracellular spaces until it's picked up by the lymphatic capillaries. And, uh, and so in one cycle, you don't get, you, in one cycle, your blood isn't 100% cleaned, you see, because if the cleaning action takes place in those lymphatic, in those lymph nodes, well, only 10%, so, you know, the, the cycle has to occur again and again and again and again and over and over and over and over and over and over. And so the blood is slowly cleaned uh, rather than, you know, one one time shot every time you have uh, one cycle. Okay, doing good, doing good. All right, a little bit about the lymph nodes. So now let's... So now let's um, shift and see what is, you know, what does the lymph, no lymph node look like? What's inside of it? So we have roughly 600 lymph nodes located along the lymphatic vessels, and they're in line, like we said before, and they're found in clusters, uh, submandibular, under the, uh, under the, uh, kind of under the, under the jaw there, uh, cervical, axillary under your armpits, uh, abdominal lymph nodes, pelvic, inguinal, inguinal, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you put your, 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 uh, your hands on your hips. If you put your hands on your hips, they're kind of like right, be right below your, 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 your ilium of your, of your pelvis. And, uh, and then like your, you kind of push into your tummy with the tips of your fingers that sort of area there, or kind of maybe just down a little bit, um, you know, a little bit down from your, your femur there, uh, that's called inguinal, inguinal. And these areas will, like, an all, uh, oftentimes feel sore when you're, when you're sick, when you're really, really sick, uh, because they're being overworked, because the, uh, the, the, the lymph nodes are being overworked, so they'll still swell and cause inflammation, of course, and, and with inflammation you have pain and so on. Uh, the lymph nodes are bean shaped. They're no longer than like an inch, no longer like, like an inch wide or long. Uh, they got a capsule partitioned by invaginations of the capsule called trabeculae, which divide the node into these little compartments, like we like we see here. So you got this this invagination of the capsule. You got these little sections, these little segments, and uh, and these and so these um, uh, lymph nodes they have um, T cells and B cells. T cells and B cells are lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, um, and certain sections of the lymph node will have certain things so let's 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 kind of take a look at that so um so the cortex houses egg-shaped aggregates of b cells called lymphatic nodules nodules or follicles just nod the nodule just kind of means like a little bit piece of tissue uh so you got so in the cortex there you get b cells all right a lymphatic nodule consisting of mainly B cells is, is called primary, a primary lymphatic nodule for, for, the, for the moment, for the moment. Most lymphatic nodules in the outer cortex are secondary lymphatic nodules, which form in response to an antigenic challenge when, you're, when you get sick, and are sites of plasma cell and memory 
B cell formation. After B cells in a primary lymphatic nodule recognize the antigen, then the primary nodule, we call it, it develops into a secondary lymphatic no nodule. Um, so we got we got B cells, we got plasma cells, memory B cells, all different kinds of of, of B cells. The center of a secondary lymphatic nodule contains a region of cells called a germinal center. Germinal center. You see that um, uh, in the top right there, the the, uh, the the orange then. The orange is the germinal center. And these contain B cells, macrophages, and follicular dendritic cells. And get used to uh, to, to hearing and, and, and saying these words, these 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 uh, these other cells, because you're going to hear it over and over and over and over. All right, macrophage. So so the so the uh, germinal center contains B cells, macrophages, and follicular dendritic cells. When follicular dendritic cells present, these 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 dendritic cells are are called antigen presenting cells because they present stuff, exogenic, exogenic, exogenic um, stuff to your uh, lymphocytes to do something about it. Um, ickies, uh, pathogens, they'll, they'll, they, they, they break up and, and grab a piece of uh, whatever it is, a virus or pathogen, and they'll, they'll break it up, take a piece, and present it to say, hey, we got to do something about this you know, not the one that I broke up, but there's a lot more of these pathogens around. Um, so they present an antigen, which is a little piece, a little piece of protein, just a little piece of the pathogen that it happened to break up. B cells proliferate and develop into antibody-producing plasma cells or into memory B cells, and memory B cells persist after an initial immune response and remember having encountered a specific antigen. Okay, so B cells. B cells, what do these guys do? They wait around and recognize a piece of protein called an antigen um, when present when it when presented, follicular dendritic cells will will show a B cell uh, a foreign agent called an, an antigen, something from from outside, from outside the body, uh, like bacteria, for example. B cells, what do they do? Do they do they attack? Not necessarily. Um, they they proliferate into plasma cells. Plasma cells then make a whole bunch of antibodies, and then the antibodies can agglutinate or 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 um, or what have you. Um, but they also the B cells can also proliferate into memory B cells. That way, in the case of a, a, a an attack down the road, um, these B cells, these memory B cells will um, make antibodies um, much quicker, much faster immune response, and you may never even have any symptoms when you get attacked another time. And we are getting attacked every single day, for sure, and yet we are with without symptoms because of these memory B cells. <laughs> Because there, you know, our body undergoes an attack, uh, um, our counter attack, if you will, and uh, and take care of the problem before you get any symptoms, you know, which is, you know, whatever sinus issues or or you know fever or whatever. The inner cortex contains mainly T cells and dendritic cells that have come from other tissues. So there is this. So this whole piece here, you have this. Uh, this you have the inner cortex and you have an outer cortex. So the inner cortex um, contains 
T cells and um, dendritic cells. And uh, the dendritic cells present antigens to T cells just like they present cells to B cells. But T cells don't make uh, plasma cells which make um, antibodies. T cells actually physically attack. Um, and so when the dendritic cells present antigens to T cells, T cells then cause their proliferation and the new, newly formed T cells then leave the lymph node and spread out throughout the, the whole body. And when they do this, uh, they are attracted by this uh, by, 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 by chemicals. They can actually uh, sense where the um, uh, where the uh, the problem is in our interstitial fluids, um, um, in the cell, between cells, in the connective tissue, and uh, and and attack. Okay, so we have been talking about a lot about B cells and T cells. We know a little bit about the difference between them. Um, B cells, they make, B cells can proliferate into memory B cells for later on, or into plasma cells, and plasma cells make antibodies. Um, and, but, but they are, but they're activated by when they're presented with an antigen, with a foreign antigen. Uh, and T cells are also activated when they're, so they also can sense, they're sensitive to antigens when presented. Um, in both cases here, that as we saw here, uh, they were dendritic cells that presented. We have other kinds of antigen presenting cells. Um, and but but T cells don't make plasma cells which make antibodies. T cells uh, will migrate out of the lymph nodes and and go to where the anti and anti antigenic activity is. Here's a here's a, a, a photo of your different um, where you you'll have different um, uh, aggregates of lymph nodes. And, uh, and and on the right there, um, when the lymphatic system, when the vessels are attacked with viruses, um, they'll the, they, they'll swell. When they swell, the 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 the, the walls will weaken. Um, the valves don't are, are can't reach each other, and the fluid starts to build up. This is lymphedema, and um, uh, I think you've heard of uh, elephantiasis. This is this is this is uh, um, caused by this this uh, attack of the the lymph system. Okay. Um, now, in the medulla of the lymph node, we also have B cells. We also have antibody-producing, uh, sorry, B cells, which are uh, antibody-producing plasma cells. Um, uh, sorry, that, that make anti an, an, antibody-producing plasma cells that have migrated out of the cortex and into the medulla and macrophages as well. As lymph enters the convex side of the lymph node, the convex side, remember you got the afferent going out the convex side. You see how everything is is sort of uh, set up so that no matter where the lymph enters, it's always going to go through the same, whether you're, you're coming from the bottom or from the top, you're going to go through the same set of tissue and then you're going to go out the uh, the efferent on the other side there on the right side um, as lymph enters the convex side of the lymph node foreign substances are trapped 
by the reticular fibers within the sinuses of the lymph node. Macrophages destroy some of the substances by phagocytosis, where lymphocytes destroy others by immune responses. The filtered lymph then leaves the concave side of the lymph node, and out you go. So now we have cleaned lymph going out the, uh, the efferent side and through the efferent lymphatic vessels. The spleen, the spleen, there's, there's no lymph here. There's no lymph, but we, it's still considered part of the lymphatic system. Why? Well, because it's a filter. And so, in, in it, in it, in it cleans. It doesn't clean the same way, but it, it cleans the blood. Um, similar. I mean, not similar. I mean, it, 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 it's a filter, and it cleans the blood, and so does the lymphatic system. And so, um, we, it's part of the the, uh, the lymphatic system. Blood flowing into the spleen through the splenic artery enters the white pulp, where you have lymphocytes and, and macrophages where B cells and T cells carry out immune functions. So there they are again. There's no, there, there's no lymph necessarily, but, you, but B cell, Bs and Ts are there in the spleen. And they carry out immune functions just the same. Exactly, exactly, exactly the same. Um, while the spleen macrophages destroy blood-borne pathogens by phagocytosis. Within the red pulp, so that was the white pulp, the red pulp then has red blood cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells. Well, the, the macrophages remove worn out red blood cells, they engulf phagocytosis, same deal, and platelets, but also in the red pulp, you store a third of the body's platelets as well as um, white blood cells too. It also stores white blood cells. So what what what's all this? So what does the spleen do, or why is it a part of this this chapter? Well, it's a filter. It's a filter, but it and it also stores platelets and uh, and white blood cells. And and what what's the filter part? Well, it it's it, it has B cells and T cells. It's cleaning, and 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 macrophages that remove worn out red blood cells, you know, red blood cells and platelets and it removes bloodborne pathogens so it's in a sense i mean it it i mean it does exact i mean it, in a sense it's it does the exact same thing as a uh, as the lymph nodes but even more because it it it, it it's uh, it stores platelets and and white blood cells too so, but 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 not through lymph. I mean, it's not like lymph was carried to the spleen. It's it's this happens just through regular circulatory system vessels through through the splenic artery. So that so that's the spleen. Then you got these lymphatic nodules. Now. Now, careful, I'm not saying node, I'm not saying a lymphatic node, but a lymphatic nodule, a tissue, it's just, it's just tissue. Um, and, uh, and they're scattered throughout the connective tissue of mucous membranes, lining the, the GI tract, the urinary system, reproductive tracts, and the respiratory airways. Lymphatic nodules in these areas are also referred to as MALT, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Mu because mucosa, because it's it's they're found in the in the lining of the mucous membranes of these different organs, like the gastrointestinal tract and so on. Some nodules occur in large aggregates, like in the tonsils of the pharynx and in the pyrus patches of the ileum of the small intestine. Tonsils form a ring uh, at the junction of the oral cavity and the nasopharynx, and these are strategically positioned to participate in immune responses against inhaled or ingested. It's, it, they're, 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 they're placed strategically where you might need them the most. Why the mouth? Well, we breathe in through our mouth and our nose. So you got these, all these different, to these tonsils 
um, like the pharyngeal tonsil and the palatine, palatine and the lingual. Um, so, well, what's inside? I don't get it. What's inside these tonsils? Well, it's the same stuff. You have white blood cells that carry out immune immune functions. So, it if they're right, if, if those white blood cells happen to be right where right at the doors of the of the body where the body is is most vulnerable to external to the uh you know external environment um then it makes sense to put them there that way uh you can attend you know not not you know make sense to put them right at the outside rather than in the middle of the body somewhere to to finally you know so you don't give the uh pathogens a chance to to attack um, your, so, someone might ask, which, which tonsils do we, uh, you know, when you do a, a tonsillectomy, which ones do we remove? It's the palatine tonsils that, that we remove, um, when you do a, a tonsillectomy, the, the palatine. Um, kids, kids, kids often get, um, uh, you know, an, an adenoid nectomy. Uh, and a, a tonsillectomy; those are often they often swell, uh, and then they they just don't they they just don't uh, they don't go back once they once they swell they swell and it's uh, um, it kind of decreases the the quality of life because you can't it's hard to breathe you're always kind of breathing heavy snoring at night. Um, it's not like, and you don't get like, if you don't do it, it's not like you, you get sick any easier. Um, but, you know, they, they swell so much that it's kind of, it can be trouble, you know, you can have trouble swallowing or you got to, you know, little kids, they, their, their appetite could be decreased because they, they can't really have big bites of food, stuff like that. And what they eat might, um, you know, less less variety of food, smaller variety because they can't just eat anything. They get it, you know. Here's a here's a uh, diagram. Here's the small intestine. You get the those pyre patches right there. Okay, so that concludes. So that concludes the um, the the lymphatic side of of this unit the the next then the next subdivision is the immunity now the immune system even though they're this even though they're it's hard to talk about one without the other now we're going to kind of move away from lymph specifically and we're going to just focus on the cells themselves these white blood cells um and and uh and where are they located where are they made where do they go what do they look like what do they do how do they attack how do they contribute to immunity um so the so immunity can be subdivided into innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate is the already present immunity. This stuff is is uh, this this immunity includes the external physical and chemical barriers provided by the skin and mucous membranes. So the skin is part of the is part of our immune system. It's 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 innate. We're 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 we're, we're born with it. It's it's already existing. Uh, mucous membranes. It also includes various internal defenses like antimicrobial substances, like proteins, uh, natural killer cells. Careful, not I'm not I didn't say cytotoxic T cells, but natural killer cells. Phagocytes, like macrophages and 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 so on. Um, Inflammation, part of the immune system, innate immune system, and and fever. 
The skin and mucous membranes are the first line of defense against pathogens, providing both physical and chemical barriers that discourage pathogens and foreign substances from penetrating the body. The skin, like between the, the skin and mucous membranes, it's almost impossible to get sick. You can almost, I mean, it's basically impossible. The skin is, is amazing. I mean, 99.999% of the time that we get sick, it's because a pathogen has gotten in, I mean, you know, like sick from outside the body. It, it's, be, it, it's, it's because a pathogen has gotten in through the nose or the mouth or some, some opening, the eye. It's really, really difficult to attack the body and be successful going through the skin. Of course, unless you break the skin, if you're bleeding or something like that. And then, of course, you got your, your mucous membranes. So this, this is the first line of defense, and all this is part of the immune, uh, the, the innate immunity. The, epi the epithelial layer of mucous membranes secretes mucus, trapping microbes. In the nose, the mu mucus-coated hairs, the cilia, uh, traps um, and filter microbes and dust and so on. The mucous membranes of the upper respiratory system tract contain cilia, forming the mucus escalator, like in the respiratory system. And lacrimal glands of the eyes secrete lysozyme containing tears that can break down the cell walls of certain bacteria. Pretty cool. Other fluids include saliva, urine, vaginal secretions, perspiration. These all have components in them that help um, inhibit attacks in the body, whether it's pH or uh, antimicrobial substances. The um, also in the uh, innate, so we're still in the innate immunity. When pathogens penetrate the first line of defense, you get the second line of defense. You got, um, and then we're going to go through these one by one. You have antimicrobial substances, natural killer cells, phagocytes, inflammation, and fever. <laughs> We got interferons. These are proteins produced by lymphocytes, macrophages, and fibroblasts when infected with viruses. Interferons. These are these are little proteins. So when a virus infects a cell, when a virus infects a cell, here we have in in blue. There you see a virus. And though that that's that the the biggest structure there that's that's one of our cells. Um, uh, well, let me let me uh, inter the 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 cells then will release interferons, and these proteins diffuse to uninfected in neighboring cells to induce the synthesis of antiviral proteins that interfere with the viral replication. Interference can't prevent viruses from attaching and penetrating the host, but they don't need to because viruses can only cause disease if they can replicate within the body cells. So you got it you got a virus, it it uh, it attacks one cell. Then this cell will make interference, and it will send it out to neighboring cells. So see the little, uh, the little red, little red, little red proteins. The neighboring cells have receptors that are sensitive to those interferons, and these interferons then will cause cause the neighboring cells to uh, to, to to not replicate they, they will they will make sure they sort of interfere with the see if, if you remember um, viruses need hosts they 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 hijack viruses hijack the uh, the DNA of cells in, in order to, to 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 replicate and they 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 tell the uh, 
the the nucleus to undergo uh, transcription and translation and to, to, to replicate. Well, these interferons interfere with the replication and therefore um, the virus can no longer um, replicate and that's the end of it. So you can't like destroy, so these, these guys don't necessarily destroy the virus, like rip it up into shreds, but they can stop the virus from replicating and therefore the, the virus is rendered useless. And uh, and then what happens with the so but what happens with your with the cells that were infected? Well, they just they undergo um, apoptosis, which is the destruction of it. So the the cells the our own body cells then just um, die die off, and that and that's it. And that and that's the end of it. So this is all. This is part of the innate immune system. So. Uh, the second line of defense it, A is your internal and antimicrobial substances like these proteins called interferons. We also got natural killer cells. When microbes penetrate the first line of defense, the next non-specific defense are these natural killer cells as well as phagocytes. Uh, they're found in the blood, they're found in the spleen, lymph nodes, red bone marrow, natural killer cells. Although they lack the membrane molecules that identify B and T cells, they, they don't, they, they, um, they do have the ability to kill a wide variety of infected body cells and, and, and tumor cells. Um, Natural killer cells attack any body cells that display abnormal or unusual uh, plasma membrane proteins. <coughs> um, okay, so so um, our every single cell of our body. Every single cell in our body, like the trillions that we have, our cells make this protein called MHC1. And they make the protein and they put it on the, on the surface of their plasma membrane. So on the surface of on the surface of every single cell of our body contains MHC1 protein. Well, well, natural killer cells, at, um, okay, so, so, so we got, we got this, this, um, we got this, so you got this protein, okay, on, on the surface of your cell. Now, if, if your, if, if a particular cell, let's say, um, uh, you know, let's say uh, um, a, a skin cell, let's just say a, a skin cell is, contains, uh, we're talking about a skin cell, and it has MHC1 on, on the outside. Well, on top of that, on top of that protein, it will, it will, it will show a little flag that little flag is either going to have an exogenous or endogenous um, antigen. A little, you know, a little flag, and if it's, it should be endogenous. In, in other words, the flag should come from within the body. It's, it's, it's saying, hey, I'm good. You don't have to just, don't, don't, don't destroy me. The but a sick body cell will still have the MHC1 protein, but it will be. But it, if it's been infected by, let's say, a bacteria, our own body cells do have the ability to break up the bacteria, take a piece, a small piece of the of the protein of this bacteria, small piece like like a little peptide, and make it into a little flag 
and stick it on top of the MHC1 pro, uh, protein and wave it around like a flag. I mean, it doesn't really wave it around. It just sticks it up there. Uh, and this little peptide is called exogenous because this tissue, this little piece of peptide, it ha has come from outside the body. So we call it exogenous, not endogenous. So that's the difference. When it's sick, when it's sick, um, when the cell is sick, it will display an exogenous peptide or, or antigen. And when it's health, when it's healthy, when there's nothing wrong, it'll display a an endogenous flag um, on its MHC1. All right. Sorry that that was kind of long, but I had to give you some background um, so we can t talk about this. Uh, all right, so now let's go back to this natural killer cell thing. So the, the last line here on this slide, natural killer cells attack any body cells that display abnormal or unusual pl plasma membrane proteins. So what does that, what does that mean? What would abnormal mean? Well, if the MHC1 protein has an exogenous uh, flag or antigen, that's what we're talking about. Or our own body cells, when sick, they might just be so sick that they just don't make the protein at all. Natural killer cells can, can recognize that. They can detect an abnormal MHC1, or they can detect that the cell, that your own body cells, is just missing the MHC1 altogether. Natural killer cell, keep it, keep it, uh, you know, make a table and make a table and just start listing um, all the different kinds of cells, even though we're still in the immu uh, innate immunity, you, you know, I, I, that's what I, that, that's what I, that's the, I, I feel is the best way to kind of keep all the different immune cells straight is just, you just start making a table, a, a list on the left hand side, you got natural killer cells and B cells, T cells, what do they do and what do they recognize, how do they, how do they carry out the attack or how do they contribute. When natural killer cells bind to an infected target cell, granules containing toxic substances are released from the natural killer cells. Some of these granules contain a protein called perforin, like per coming from the word perforate, like a straw basically that inserts into the plasma membrane of the target cell and cre creates perforations in the membrane. Extracellular fluid then flows in and ca causes cytolysis. Um, which is uh, li to lice. To, to the, it, it, um, cyto is cell and lice is to, to, to blow up, basically, to break up. So because extracellular fluid is um, flowing in so much, the, the, the cell basically explodes. So you got these, this natural killer cell, it'll bind when it recognizes that a cell is sick, It'll make perforins, it'll stick like straws, it'll literally jab the, the, the sick cell with a whole bunch of these uh, perforin proteins, and then fluid will go in, will be forced in. Um, granzymes go in, which are these enzymes, and because it's, it's high in, uh, the high, concentration grade is higher, the extracellular fluid goes in, and it explodes, causes the cytolysis. Um, other granules release protein digesting granzymes and induces the target cell to self-destruct. Phagocytes can then come up, sweep up, and destroy the microbes left behind. <clears throat> so, uh, pretty, pretty cool, huh? That's, that's natural, that's your natural killer cell. They have the so the things that I that I want you to be familiar with, I mean that, that I want you to know like as a summary is natural killer cells are part of the innate immune innate immunity. They can recognize on our they can they go around recognizing, sensing 
our own body cells looking for the MHC1 protein. If it's missing, it'll carry it attack. If it sees that you have an, uh, an exogenous antigen on the flag of the MHC1 protein, it will um, carry out an attack. How does it carry, carry out the attack? Well, it binds, releases perforins and granzymes, and uh, and cause cytolysis or apoptosis, which is um, the cell dying. Okay. All right. That is natural killer cell. Phagocytes. Phagocytes are specialized cells that ingest microbes. The two major types are neutrophils and mac and macrophages. Neutrophils and macrophages are, uh, are are phagocytes. When there is an infection, neutrophils and monocytes migrate to the infection. During this migration, monocytes enlarge and become wandering macrophages. Ma ma monocytes become uh, macrophages and they become dendritic cells. <clears throat> here's how here's here's how it happens. Um, first chemotaxis, which is the uh, which the, so the chemicals from the microbes, there's chem the microbes send out these um, uh, um, these chemicals. white blood cells send out chemicals. Um, damaged tissue send out these chemicals um, like like cytokines and and attract and so the the and so these phagocytes can detect they, it's like they smell they can smell uh, they detect these 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 chemicals and so by positive chemotaxis they they know where to go so they continue to travel towards the where you have trouble then they bind adherence the phagocyte attaches they engulf they ingest the plasma the plasma membrane extends these pseudopods and then they digest the phagosome the ph phagosome uh, merges with the lysosome and the lysozymes and antioxidants will then kill the phagocytic cell. So here, here you have. Uh, um, so the the purple is the uh, the phagocyte, the big cell. It'll ingest the microbe, or undergo phagocytosis. That's why it's called a phagocyte. And it'll bind with uh, lysozymes, and the light the the enzymes then will just degrade, uh, break down the the microbe, and and uh, and that's the end of it. Um, uh, but but um, some phagocytes can also uh, take part, take a piece, take a little peptide of the microbe and, and uh, display it on their body, on the surface of their cell, and go up to the uh, lymphatic nodes and present it. Um, and... Uh, but uh, like your dendritic cells, um, so that that's your uh, that's your phagocyte, and uh, and for our second to last um, piece of the uh, innate immunity. We have inflammation. Inflammation is a non-specific defense, defensive response of the body to tissue and damage. Pathogens, abrasions, chemical irritations, distortions, or disturbance of the cells, extreme temperatures can cause inflammation, like swelling and heat and redness and pain. And it's it's an attempt to dispose of these foreign substances. Uh, to prevent their spread to foreign, to other tissues like swelling, for example, and to prepare the site for tissue repair and attempt to restore tissue homeostasis. Well, how do you do it? Well, 
first you vasodilate the area. That's why there's there's redness. Why would you want to vasodilate the vessels around uh, to increase um, red blood cells, to increase nutrients, white blood cells, to, to get to the site of injury or attack? So you want to vasodilate and increase permeability. Uh, then you then phagocytes will move in to the interstitial uh, fluid, and then you have tissue repair. <clears throat> Histamine is released from mast cells and basophils. <clears throat> And uh, and neutrophils and macrophages are attracted to the site of injury and also stimulate the release of histamine, which causes more vasodilation, increased permeability of blood vessels, and so you have this positive feedback loop where it just it it, it you get more and more and more inflammation and oh put ice well. Yeah, you know, if you know what you're doing, you put ice, but cr keeping the inflammation going, you could, uh, uh, you know, heal quicker. All right. And finally, you have fever. Fever, the abnormally high temperature that occurs because the hypothalamus is is reset. It's It, it, it commonly occurs during infection and inflammation. Uh, many bacterial toxins elevate blood temperature, sometimes by triggering the release of fever-causing cytokines. Cytokine, there's that word again. Um, sig signaling proteins. Cytokines are just signaling proteins, such as interleukin-1 from macro macrophages. And elevated temperature, elevated body temperature intensifies the effects of these interferons inhibits the growth of some microbes and speeds up body reactions that aid repair. Why would you want fever? Uh, because you have increased uh, with fever, with the higher temperature, your enzymes um, can work faster, decreasing the that activation energy needed. Um, you know, sometimes we... Uh, you know, when we get a cold or, fe or a, 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 um, you know, when we get a, a, a f the flu, we get really, really hot, right? You get really, really hot and, and you, get, you get blankets and blankets, yet you get the chills. Well, how on earth do I have the chills if I'm like 104 degrees and I got 50 blankets on me? I don't get it. Well, it's because the hypothalamus has been reset at a higher temperature and so the whole rest of the body will continue to work it thinks that it's freezing and it'll continue to work uh until the until the the sickness is 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 taken care of so you so the chills i mean what do what do chills chills create that that this uh you generate heat with the um, skeletal muscle contraction generate heat generate heat you get your your body hotter and hotter and hotter and that way you can intensify these these effects and inhibit growth of some microbes because uh, it's too hot for them it speeds up body reactions okay that is all innate immunity all this stuff is sort of um it's always working it's working all the time, every every moment, um, every moment of the day, every moment of the night. Never takes a rest. Twenty four hours, uh, our innate immunity is working. Adaptive immunity is um, not working twenty four hours a day. The adaptive immunity comes along only after the innate immunity is in big, big, big trouble. The adaptive immunity, you might get sick or you might be attacked several times and the adaptive immunity may never actually be triggered. 
What exactly is it? It's the ability to defend against specific strains, specific strains of invading agents like bacteria X, Y, Z, or toxins, viruses, etc. Innate immunity is, you know, like for example, like the uh, our neutrophil, our 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 our, um, our our macrophages, our phagocytes, or or um, our natural killer cells. They can, I mean, they're just going around looking uh, for sick body cells, for example. They're not really looking for a specific um, uh, pathogen like like the flu might cause. You, you, you see? The adaptive immunity, they don't, the, the, the cells of the adaptive immunity doesn't necessarily uh actually uh doesn't recognize uh, just any sick cell but they're looking for very 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 specific and so you can kind of gear all your energy toward looking for one specific um foreign pathogen and that way the adaptive immunity can sort of be um um you know it's it's outfitted better, so it, they they kind of have like two different um, they work together, but they kind of have two different functions. The the let's see any substance that is recognized as a foreign as foreign and provoke an immune response is called an antigen. Um, you know we already talked about the let's see here A and P two we we've already talked about uh, you know antigens. Our own self-identifying flags, you know, on our red blood cells. Found anti antigens are just proteins. They could be, they could be exogenous. They could be endogenous. Here we're generally talking about exogenous. We're talking about foreign foreign agents uh, when we talk about antigens. The two properties that distinguish adaptive immunity from innate immunity is specificity and memory. Specificity for particular antigens, which also involves distinguishing self from non-self. And secondly, memory. We're talking about memory B cells and memory T cells. For most previously encountered antigens, so that a second encounter can prompt an even more rapid response. You might, you might, you might um, not even really tell that you, you, you might not even have any symptoms, you know, the second time around because of that memory. It's, it's, it's the, it's, it's, and, but the, this memory, um, slowly fades away over the years that's why we keep needing booster shots booster shots to to spike our to increase those memory cells again um both b cells and pre t cells develop in primary lymphatic organs like red bone marrow and the thymus b cells stay and mature in bone marrow, but pre T cells migrate to the thymus and then they mature there. Uh, you have helper T cells. You also you, you might also read in, in textbooks um, CD4 uh, T cells. These are the, these are the helper cells, uh, and these have antigen receptors um, plus the CD4 proteins on their plasma membranes. And then you have your cytotoxic T cells, which are also called your, your CD8 uh, T cells. And these have antigen receptors plus the CD8 protein on their plasma membranes. There's the thymus there, where the, the T cells will mature. Little diagram of uh, the route, kind of from beginning to end. In cell-mediated adaptive immunity, cytotoxic T cells. So now we're pretty much gonna like, we're done talking about all those other, all those other cells. Now we're gonna focus on your T cells and your B cells, and like your you know, there's a few other ones, but a lot of it is gonna be your your C's and your T's. Uh, sorry, your B's and your T's. Cytotoxic T cells directly attack invading antigens 
and is particularly effective against intracellular pathogens like bacteria and viruses as well as cancer cells. Cell-mediated immunity always involves cells attacking cells. Cell-mediated immunity means cells attacking cells, like your cytotoxic T cells attacking cells. They leave secondary lymphatic organs and tissues, migrate to seek and destroy infected target cells and cancer cells. You remember how the T cells were just sitting in the uh, in the lymph node, and then when they're presented with an antigen, they they leave, they migrate out of the lymph node and into uh, the area where there's an attack. Well, this is the same. This is what we're talking about here. They first recognize. Then they attach, so they, they have the ability to, to recognize um, um, the, the, the MHC protein. They attach to the target cell. Then they deliver a lethal hit that kills, sort of like how natural killer cells do, but cytotoxic T cells have receptors specific for a particular microbe and thus kill only specific body cells. <clears throat> we keep talking about this specificity, specificity. So we're going to see how this even works. We're going to see how this even works just in a second here. You got some uh, killing instructions. It's kind of, kind of like natural killer cells. Kind of like natural killer cells. You have the, the, the cytotoxic T cells, they can do one of two things. Number one, they can, you can use your receptors to recognize and bind Then you could release granzymes, which trigger uh, apoptosis. The released microbes are killed by uh, phagocytes. Or you can re release perforin and will insert into the plasma membrane just like we saw before. Fluid flows in and cytolysis occurs. And, uh, th and then they also release uh, granulysin and it will enter through the channels and destroy. Very, very, very similar just like your natural killer cells. Here's a little, uh, just kind of a, a nice SEM of a, you got a red blood cell on the left and you got a, you got the platelet um, in the middle there and, uh, and you got a, a T cell you see how uh, you see how the T cell is basically the same size as the red blood cell. You, that's because a T cell is a, a lymphocytes, a lymphocytes basically the same, basically the same size. Okay, we're going to we're we're gonna keep going. We're gonna we're gonna find out like why like how is it so how are these things so or in in what capacity are these able to find are able to look for specific cells um, in, in, in the next few slides here. So we had, so we just got done talking about cell-mediated adaptive immunity. Cell-mediated, we're talking about T cells. T cells undergo cell-mediated adaptive immunity. Well, you got ant antibody-mediated adaptive immunity, antibody-mediated. In ant antibody-mediated adaptive immunity, B cells will first transform into plasma cells. And these guys synthesize and secrete specific proteins called antibodies, or immunoglobins. B cells differentiate into plasma cells. Plasma cells make antibodies. This immunity works against extracellular pathogens like bacteria and viruses, and since antibody mediated immunity involves antibodies binding to antigens in body tumors, it's also called humoral immunity. Humoral means humors, uh, the liquid portion. So um, uh, in the blood, for example, or in the interstitial fluid, antibodies then can go to work. Um, but it's not 
it's the, we're not talking about cells. We're not talking about T cells attacking cells. We're talking about antibodies, which are proteins attacking cells, and they don't really even attack. They have different. Um, they they do different functions. We we've heard about uh, uh, agglutination. We heard about agglutination. There's a couple other um, different types of attacking that uh, that antibodies um, can do too. There is active immunity and passive immunity. We're going to um, just skip over that. Um, but this is a nice little a table of the you know kind of organizing your adaptive immunity and uh, your your innate immunity. Um, and here's another one where you have okay you got your adaptive immunity and then you have your cell mediated and then your an antibody mediated immunity below it. Uh, all right, well. What is cell mediated immunity? What what attacks what? And then with antibody, what attacks what? So you can take a closer look at that. So let's delve in even a little bit more. Let's delve in even a little bit more here. Initially, there is only a small group of lymphocytes like helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, B cells, with, with the correct antigen receptors to respond to a particular antigen. All right, you get sick, you get, you get infected, uh, you know, why, why on earth do we keep getting, why do I, why do I keep getting colds? Why do I get, why do I get three colds every single year? Or one cold every single year. I thought it, I thought that like once you get attacked once you get attacked by some virus, you never get sick with that virus again. Well, that is very true. It's because there's different strains. There's, because there's a different strain, um, it's still considered a the cold the cold virus is just a slightly different strain of virus, and um, but you will never get sick with the same one again, or or at least if you do, it'll be it, it'll be a swift recovery. So here we're talking about how exactly does this specificity occur with these with our our, our T's and B's with this adaptive immunity. First, we have only a small group of lymphocytes that have the correct antigen to respond to your cold virus that you just got. You only have a few. Cell-mediated and, and antibody-mediated immunity responses often work together because generally there will be large copies of that particular antigen. Because the large number of antigens initially outnumber the small group that we have in our body, the, the large number of, you know, the virus outnumber the small group of, of our helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, etc. With the correct antigen, when they encounter and receive stimulatory cues, they undergo what's called clonal selection. Cloning. They begin to clone. They clone themselves, which occur in the secondary lymphatic organs and tissues. And then they proliferate and differentiate, forming highly specialized cells in response, making clones and now able to recognize the same specific antigen as the original lymphocyte. The result of cloning is often your swollen tonsils or, or lymph nodes. So, how, so, I mean, we really haven't seen anything yet, but what what does this slide what is the the summary of the slide adaptive immunity is specific immunity we have we have t cells and b cells that 
there's a small number. I mean, no matter what we get hit with, what sickness, we, what virus or bacteria we get, we get hit with, we have a small. We, we will always have a small number that actually um, will be able to recognize it, because we have literally we have millions of different um, T cells and B cells that can recognize any any version, any strain of any virus or bacteria, but we only have a few of them. So they will copy themselves, ident they will make identical copies of themselves, and therefore they they will proliferate. And now, so now soon after, we will have an, a huge amount of cells that are going to be able to respond to one specific strain or one specific antigen. Those all those cells that just got copied, they're not going to go around the body looking from one to one to one and fixing other things. Nope, they they have one job, which is to rid the body of one that one specific pathogen. How do how do B cells have the capability of recognizing and cloning that cells that will react to specific antigens? If there are millions upon millions of different bacteria and viruses not to mention the ever-evolving microbes, well, each B cell has 10,000 identical membrane-bound antibodies. Antibodies bound to the B cells. We have free-floating, and we have, there's ones that are bound. You know, we usually draw like 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 four or five. Here's one. I mean, here's one on, on a B cell. Uh, during development, B cells recombine bits of proteins that make up the antibody receptor, which you see here. And the result is virtually unlimited combinations. There are 10 to the 10 different combinations of variable portions on each antibody. Every B cell is slightly different from the next. So this is how we this is how we have so many different kinds that'll recognize anything, but we only have a small amount of number of, of each of those. Does that make sense? So it's the variable region you see up on the on the top there. So it's the variable region. Do you remember in uh, in meios you remember in meiosis how you have um, like like why are we slightly different than our parents? Why do we look slightly different than our parents? Well, because in meiosis we have um, crossing over, and uh, and and uh, in, you know in, in um, independent assortment and, and crossing over like little bits of pieces of, of DNA will will well it's sort of the same thing sort of the same deal. You have and in this variable portion of these of these antibodies they'll recombine bits of protein, and therefore that. That particular antibody bound to that particular B cell will recognize that particular, you know, one particular uh, pathogen. And if you have hundreds of thousands of different antibodies with hundreds of thousands of ten to the ten different combinations, no matter what nature will throw at us, we will, we are already prepared. Tell me that is not super, super cool. And so you see how there's like, uh, you see the different colors. So the different color um, uh, hexagons there, those are just exempt. Those would be like uh, like the pathogen. So the first one can recognize the orange or whatever color orange. And the second one can recognize a red one. And the, the third one can recognize a green one. They're not really, they don't really have colors, but they're, those are different those are examples of different strains of different bacteria or, or viruses. Okay? So this is this is specificity. So this is how we can recognize specific and so so then they will clone. They will clone themselves. And then you suddenly have so let's say it's the yellow. So say let's say our body gets hit with the yellow pathogen, then our body will uh uh that B cell will 
will clone itself over and over and over and over and over and over and it will only recognize that one thing. It won't go around looking for other, other problems, just that yellow pathogen. Okay, next. Helper T cells become active helper T cells. Cytotoxic T cells become active cytotoxic T cells. B cells become plasma cells. These generally die when the immune system is no longer needed. But memory T's and, and memory cytotoxic T's and memory B, these do not act, actively participate in the initial response, but if the same antigen encounters the body again later on, memory cells are available to initiate a far swifter reaction than they than the first by proliferating and differentiating into more memories and T's. And so that's that's the deal with the memories. They, they can then, uh, upon a second attack, uh, they can differentiate into anything they want. Because there are now more specific memory cells floating around, they are more likely to bump into the respective antigen and thus a quicker immune response results. Okay, so I, I hope that makes sense. The second response is so fast that the antigen is destroyed before any signs or symptoms of disease can occur. Okay, good. Might want to take a break. <laughs> uh, we're on slide 72 of, of 103. Um, all right. We have dendritic cells. We got macrophages. And we have B cells, which are all called antigen-presenting cells. These cells have the ability to rip off, a, to destroy um, a, a piece of... Um, to, to break up an, uh, a pathogen, take a piece, put it on their MHC2 protein, and wave it around like flay, or, or uh, uh, present it to um, to your to your T cells. Uh, so here is what they here, so here are the instructions. They ingest, they split up the 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 foreign pathogen uh, into proteins, peptides. They make your the, their MHC2. They stick it up on their plasma membrane. Then they take the piece of uh, peptide and they stick that on top of their MHC2, and then they present that to the to a T cell. Um, the antigen presenting cell migrates to the lymphatic tissue and presents the antigen to a, to, to specific helper T cells, and and so on. Okay, so. So now, so, so, I got a question for you. Where do you find MHC1 proteins? Answer? They are on every single one of our own body cells, our systemic cells. Where do you find MHC2 proteins? Answer? on one of three cells, one of three immune cells, our dendritic cells, our macrophages, and our B cells, because those three are called antigen-presenting cells. They're, they're called APCs, antigen-presenting cells. All, all nucleated body cells all of, their, all of our body cells have the ability to recognize trouble within themselves and undergo these steps. We can, our, each of our cells can actually aid the, in, in immunity. They can recognize cancer or infection. They split the, the, the pathogen, the proteins, into little peptides. They, 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 they have the MHC1. Um, then they stick the piece of peptide on the MHC1 and put it up on the surface of their uh, membrane. These cells will then wait. Of course, our own body cells, they can't, you know, float around the body. They're, you know, your skin cells are just sitting there. But they, the, what they can do is wait for cytotoxic T cells to come to them. They then present the antigen to the specific T cells, which can proliferate and differentiate into more helper, helper T cells, anti-cytotoxic T cells, and, uh, and then, you know, we've, we know the rest. So here's um, 
here's a slide that that shows this uh, here's another one kind of the, the difference between your uh, MHC 2 and MHC 1 and uh, here's a little bit about our, our uh, about our antibodies here when an antigen binds when an antigen binds to the B cell receptor it becomes the B cell becomes activated. The B cell then undergoes clonal selection, and the result are plasma cells and memory B cells. B cells will become what will make plasma cells and memory B cells. Well, plasma memory plasma cells secrete hundreds of millions of antibodies for four to five days. Memory B cells quickly proliferate and differentiate into more memory B cells and more plasma cells. And an antibody, so now let's talk about these antibodies here. An antibody can combine specifically with the epitope on the antigen that's that, that triggered its production. The antibody fits with the antigen like a like a lock and key. We've we we talked about that. And antibodies belong to a group of glycoproteins called globulins, and this is where they get their name, immunoglobulins. Plasma cells can make 2,000 antibodies a second. Isn't that crazy? Each plasma cell. So imagine you have your B cells. B cells will proliferate into plasma cells. And then what's the job of these plasma cells? They make, they make antibodies. So imagine how many of these plasma cells we have. And then... Imagine that each of those can make 2,000 antibodies a second. Pretty crazy. Some, some antibodies, they can freely roam the bloodstream and bind to and hinder a pathogen from carrying out an attack on the body because there is now a, a big protein complex att attached to it, you know, you, um, opsonization is the process by which a pathogen is marked for ingestion and eliminated by a, by a phagocyte. So this is called uh, opsonization. Free antibodies can also bind to several pathogens and agglutinate. There's that word again, agglutinate, like in the, it's the like in the cardiovascular, in the blood uh, chapter. Um, and of course, you, you agglutinate. So then, what? Well, a phag phagocyte will come around and 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 engulf and destroy. Other antibodies, when synthesized, they will stay attached at the surface of B cells. So, antibodies might free, freely roam around. They could um, and 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 then mark um, mark a pathogen called optimization they might um, they might uh, uh, agglutinate a pathogen and, and wait for um, a phagocyte to come and engulf them um, or the antibody or the antibody might stay attached on the surface of the B cell some free antibodies can attach to mast cells preparing them for a possible second allergy attack you look at the uh, the difference here between um, the on the left hand side there on the y axis you have the antibody concentration and with a primary response um, <clears throat> you have you know at two weeks at two weeks you have you know a, a pretty good primary response but upon second exposure look at the immune Look at the immune response. At two weeks, it's like tripled. You know, your antibody concentration is tripled. Why? Because of those memory cells. Here is a very good table. Um, we still really haven't talked about uh, neutrophils. Um, but here's a, here's a good um, table that's sort of um, summarizes the the functions of 
of your different uh, immune cells. We're not really going to talk about, I'm not going to ask you about suppressor T cells um, or, and really not really basophils or eh, maybe a little bit for mast cells and, and then neutrophils. Here's another one. Um, we are close. We are, we're very close. We're very close. There isn't really much left. Here's a summary of the uh, immune response for uh, the innate immunity. Um, just some diagrams to go along with what we were talking about. With your B cells, T cells. Here, um, here's a, like, like with allergies, here's, here, so upon first exposure, let me just go through this first, and then we'll talk about um, other other scenarios. But first exposure, let's say to pollen, for example, some kind of allergen. So let's, let's, let's say poly, pollen stimulates B cells to produce allergy plasma cells. Of course, always it's a, you know we said the same thing over and over and over. B cells will make plasma cells or memory B cells. And then, but the, the plasma cells will make uh, antibodies. Okay, so <clears throat> first exposure to pollen <clears throat> stimulates B cells to produce plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies. So you see, um, the first the the, the first um, green blob there. <clears throat> you have um, you you got your uh, is is a mast cell, but you have your the uh, step three in there. Allergy antibodies bind to the mat. I had to pause it, so I I uh, kind of lost where I was. Okay, let, let's just let's just go through this again from the top. All right, so first exposure to pollen stimulates. B stimulates B cells to produce allergy plasma cells, and uh, so there's there's one right there in blue. Okay, so there's your plasma cell in blue. Plasma cells produce allergy antibodies. So there you see that the little um, little proteins, the little antibodies, that they are the little Ys, and allergy antibodies bind to mast cells. So the green is your is your mast cells, and the, there you see the antibodies binding. To the mast cells. The mast cell is useless by itself. By itself, the antibodies do the 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 the, um, the ma by itself the mast cell is useless. Even with the antibodies, the mast cell is still useless at this point. Even even after step three, it's still useless. It's just, it's still not doing anything. However, re-exposure to pollen results in pollen binding to allergy antibodies on the mast cells. You see, now the mast cell is, is sensitive to the, 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 the pollen because it has detectors, which is the antibodies. Step five, binding of pollen. Now, the second time, is able to is, stimulates mast cells to release histamine in blue there, uh, triggering inflammatory responses. So you see how upon first exposure, what happened? First exposure, the pollen, the, you had the little, the little yellow balls. And what this did was cause the um, plasma cells to produce antibodies. The antibodies bound uh, to the mast cells, but that's all. You're basically like lock and loaded, but the, but there's there's no immune response. I mean, there, there there's no um, uh, no, nothing, nothing further occurs. However, upon re-exposure, uh, pollen is uh, ends up able to bind to um, uh, ends up binding to the to the membrane-bound um, mast cell, and the mast cell then produces histamine, and histamine will then increase vasodilation, white blood cells, white blood cells will come to the rescue and uh, and create an, an allergy 
uh, an allergic reaction. Now, what is an allergy? What's an allergic reaction? Well, it's generally a uh, an overreaction to a protein that's generally not dangerous, like peanut butter, or uh, pet dander, or pollen, or um, um, I mean anything, strawberry. I mean anything, any fruit, any vegetable has protein in it, you know, strawberry proteins. Um, so, like, well, okay, the, none of that stuff is dangerous. Well, yeah, that, that's what an allergy is. It's an allergic reaction. It's an overreaction of the immune system. Now, in this example, there were two exposures, first exposure and second exposure. Obviously, uh, it can, this, this process could occur over a very, very, very long time upon 10 exposures or a hundred exposures. Um, but, uh, but, but, but yeah, this, this is just to kind of keep it simple. Uh, so, um, so be, be familiar with those, with those steps. Here's a nice, uh, diagram kind of flow chart you see the uh in the middle of the, the diagram there uh you got your basophil neutrophil eosinophil monocyte you see the monocyte differentiating into um, macrophage there monocytes also become those dendritic cells so monocytes can become macrophage or dendritic cells and then of course you got your your lymphocytes so there's your fifth fifth on the right hand side there your lymphocyte which also come from the same place as your uh, natural killer cell. And uh, B sites uh, become plasma cells, so there you have it. There you have all your, uh, pretty much, except for it's missing your, your dendritic cell. Uh, how can you, can you put these five words like into a sentence, like in a, in a, like a coherent sentence? How can you relate all these, all these five? Pause the video. Pause the video um, and try. But uh, here it goes. Um, there are three types of phagocytes. So there's the first word. Three types of phagocytes. One is a macrophage. One is a neutrophil, and one is a dendritic cell. There are three types of phagocytes: macrophages. Neutrophils and dendrites. So, how do you link monocytes to the whole deal? Well, there are well, monocytes can become one of two things: macrophages and dendritic cells. And there, there you have it. So, monocyte will, will when activated, becomes macrophages, become be, become macrophages and dendritic cells which are both phagocytes, but you also have neutrophils, which are also phagocytes. And that's it. So that's that's kind of answering that question there. And um, um, so um, phagocytes are specialized cells that move or are stationary uh, about the body and engulf worn out Cells, damaged cells, foreign pathogens, and these cells display their ingested pathogens on their MHC uh, proteins, just like <clears throat> just like body cells and B cells and T cells. Three important phagocytic cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils. There you have it. Macrophages will eat and spit, where neutrophils will eat and then self-destruct. There is the one difference between the two. But both are um, uh, sorry, but the uh, but the macrophage um, can stick a can stick a you know the piece up on its MHC protein and uh, and and present. Um, monocytes differentiate into your dendritic cells and macrophages. Okay. Uh, dendritic cells present antigens to T cells found in tissues exposed to external environment like the skin, connective tissue, respiratory tract, 
Once activated, they migrate to the lymph nodes and present, remember, dendritic cells and is an antigen presenting cell. Here's another little, here, here's kind of the same kind of flow chart as you saw before, but here you see the monocyte at the very bottom there, the monocyte uh, differentiating into dendritic cells and, and macrophages. Here's an actual, here's an actual skin photo of, uh, of dendritic cells that are found throughout the, uh, um, the epidermis there. Um, just some more information on, on neutrophils. Uh, they're, 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 they're one of the first responders to inflammation. Um, within minutes of trauma, neutrophils will swim out of the blood vessels into the specific tissue using positive chemotaxis. And, um, and then they'll phagocytize bacteria and, and pathogens. Inactive neutrophils can live for about 40 hours. And active neutrophils can, can live for up to two days. Um, how is How are natural killer cell detection different than cytotoxic T cell? If you remember, um, so you know what is the difference uh, between these guys and these guys? Um, which one belongs to innate? Which one belongs to adaptive? Which one has MHC one? Which which you know what can they recognize? That that sort of thing. Uh, you know, make a big table and and organize all this information into like a one large table that's what I would do and uh, I think we already went through this stuff but but anyway um, what's what's unique about natural killer cells is that they can detect abnormal body cells by sensing MHC1 as well as the lack of MHC1 on our body cells cytotoxic T cells respond by receiving or detecting the, the peptide that is bound to the MHC1 or MHC2 of foreign cells on their plasma membrane. Here's another difference between the natural killer and the uh, cytotoxic T cell. Cytotoxic T cells can also recognize MHC2 of foreign cells. Can you summarize the steps that the natural killer cells take? Here's uh, just some diagrams just to help visualize um, what they do. Here's some more and some more. So I'm just kind of skipping these, not because they're not important, but because we've already like talked about them and covered it so but you still I want I still want you to go through these and just make sure that everything clicks and everything is consistent with what we with, with what we uh, already covered um, and so so remember uh, T cells can't detect whole pathogens they can only detect specific antigens of those pathogens which the antigen presenting cell places on the MHC1, or sorry, MHC2 uh, protein, and uh, and and that the whole complex is placed on the cell surface. Um, and here's a little, uh, you know, so 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 we're done here. So here is here's six. Here are six cells of the immune system. Can you guess which one is which just by just by looking at them like this? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Well, um, if the first one originates in the blood and ends up in the tissue, second one. Um, oh, this is all this uh, the formatting didn't work here 
All right, well, just, just forget this first one. The formatting didn't work. It, it got messed up with this program. <clears throat> oh, I see. Uh, yeah, the first one is blood to tissue. The second one is the second one is tissue to node. The third one uh, is blood to tissue, tissue to node, node to tissue, and then the third one is, uh, or the last one is node to tissue. So this is either like their development and where they end up, or what happens after they become activated, if you can kind of figure out. All right, well, the second one and the fourth one and the fifth one are antigen-presenting cells. Can you figure out which which is which? Um, uh, if you, you know, can you figure out what's which one is the second one and the third, you know, with this piece of information? If I told you that um, the second one there has MHC2 proteins on the surface of its cell, can then you can you then figure it out? The fourth one and the fifth one also have MHC2 on the surface of their cell. Can you figure it out? Why is why are those three in black and the other ones are in red? Well, the other two are in red because they don't have them on the surface of their cell. However, they recognize an antigen on an MHC. They recognize a cell with the MHC1 or recognize that it's absent. So I, I kind of... Hopefully this will kind of jog your memory a little bit. Uh, you know, if, if, if not, I mean, this was a very, very, very long lecture, so I don't expect you to, to have all this um, down uh, just in one sitting. This is going to take several, I mean, this one lecture takes, you know, two weeks in a regular traditional uh, course. So, um, you know, you're going to definitely need to go back and take this, you know, divide this thing up several times. And and also the very last cell, the same thing. It's also in red. So it's not that this, that this cell will have MHC1 and 2 on the surface of its cell, plasma membrane, um, but it can recognize MHC1 and MHC2. And then the last piece of information that I'll give you is that the first one, eats and then self-destructs. The second one will, when I say eat, I mean phag phagocytize, engulf, and, uh, but it will present. Um, third one uses uh, perforin and granzymes. Fourth one, eat and present. Fifth one, one, two, three, yeah, fifth one, um, it will, it will, make plasma cells, it will differentiate into plasma cells, and then plasma cells into antibodies. And finally, the last one, it also makes perforin and granzymes. Hopefully that's enough information for you to figure out which is which, and we can even go further. We could even go further and say, okay, well, which one, um, which of these belong to the innate innate immunity and which ones belong to the adaptive immunity. You could do that too. There is one thing that I forgot to mention. I'm looking at it. I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to tell you which one. But, I mean, which one is is it on in this uh, on the, in this table? But the um, the 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 phagocytic uh, dendritic cell, the dendritic cell um, really is the cell that links the, um, the innate immunity with the adaptive immunity. Why? Because it, it, it starts out, it, it can start out, or it can be just floating around in the, um, in the humors, in in the humor, or in in the interstitial fluid of the of the body, in the connective tissue of the body, that the, these dendritic cells, 
and then they can engulf, phagocytize, um, and make MHC2 stick, um, stick the uh, uh, stick the peptide, the exogenous peptide, on the surface of their plasma membrane, and migrate to the lymph node and present. Present to what? Well, present to the adaptive immunity. Present to your 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 T's and your B's. So the so although there are other cells, like like the um, like the macrophage that will do the same thing. Um, I mean, you can say the macrophage and the dendritic cell uh, really are the like the link, but especially the um, the dendritic cell, just because it's it's known for for doing that mostly, um, linking the innate to the adaptive. So I, I hope you know the difference between them. I hope I mean between the innate and the in the adaptive. I hope you know which one is working all the time, which one isn't. Um, uh, you know how quickly do they respond? How do they respond? Which one respond? You know that 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 sort of thing. Um, and that seems to be about it. That seems to be about it uh, obviously the i mean there's m much 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 more information this is if you can know this information very well i would say you really know the um the immune system the lymphatic and immune system very very definitely um very very well there's always more to 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 learn there's always more to know, um, but this you would have a very, very good background um, if you just have this handout down, this video down. Okay, thank you everyone for listening and for your uh, time and attention. Um, I definitely do not expect you to have all this down in one shot um you whatever you you know you, you spend you spend an hour doing like you know a, a fourth a quarter of this and then review and then you go do the next one and then once you get to the second one you do the first review and then you once you get to your your third sitting review your first piece that you that you um learned and then the second piece that you learned and then you get to your third and once you get to your fourth sitting fourth time you, you do this you, you you figure out you see if you can remember everything from the for your first hour and then for everything from the second hour and everything from your third hour i mean this is going to take several 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 hours again this again this 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 one video is is like like two weeks of of lecturing in a in a regular traditional face-to-face -face course so um don't 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 say oh, where where am i going to you know don't say to yourself this is absolutely impossible and no it, it is it's just you know it should take it should take you a week or two to 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 get everything down um i mean at at a, at a normal pace if you're doing summer uh then you you just have to increase your hours per per week obviously um because you're you're going at eight weeks, and uh, of course, if you're doing the five week course, then you're you're tripling the the amount of hours, tripling the speed at which you're um, absorbing all this information. All right, thank you, everyone. I will not tell you which one is which. Uh, see if you guys can figure out. I mean, for this last slide, see if you can figure out which one is which, and I can just easily. You guys, you guys can uh, guess and send it to me, and uh, and then I'll give you a response if you want. All right, thank you again, and uh, and uh, study well.